Well, I'm pretty excited to be able to um, spend a few minutes this morning talking about a group of animals that usually get um, kind of pushed off to the back and ignored. Um, but they are animals, and they are in our care, and they deserve, um, they deserve to be uh, treated as well as we do the other dogs and cats in our shelter. So today my talk is going to be on uh, cheeky dogs. I'm, I'm going to use that from now on. <laughs> cheeky dogs in shelters. <laughs> um, hey, you don't need that. Um, I mentioned Previously, that one of the things we do is uh, behavior evaluations for cruelty cases and for dog bite cases. So we're, we um, um, basically, we think of them as being analogous to forensic veterinary exams. We're documenting the behavior of the animal shortly after seizure. With cruelty cases, we want to document psychological damage that's, that the animal has endured. Uh, with dog bite cases, it's usually documenting the circumstances surrounding the attack that we need to do. Oops. Um, so dogs, when they come into our shelters in protective custody, um, typically we're talking about um, them staying for lengthy periods of time. There's usually restricted access to these animals. They're typically under lock and key, um, so they don't get the same, um, same resources as the other animals. Um, serious and fatal dog attacks on humans. Um, Interestingly, this is kind of where the, the science of, or the practice of behavior evaluation started, was when um, there were instances of fatal dog attacks, and uh, um, Peter Borschelt, Victoria Voith, uh, John Wright, uh, Randy Lockwood, they were a practicing behaviorists at the time, and they got called in, and they started, um, documenting and publishing the results of their evaluations of these particular dogs. And it was from there that, that shelter behavior evaluations developed. Um, as I said, when these dogs come into our, into our shelters, typically they are um, regulated differently. There's usually no direct contact or often no direct contact with these animals. Um, they're afforded no exercise, no enrichment, no stimulation. Um, we've had situations where we've been called in to evaluate dogs that have not been out of their cages in over two years. Um, so as you can imagine, um, very, very uh, de behaviorally deteriorated at that point. Um, so a few of the things that, um, that I feel very strongly about is that there should be um, one or two at least designated handlers in your shelters um, who can interact, who can handle these dogs, who can get them out outside. Um, it's extremely important to have an ongoing um, enrichment program for these animals, um, at least in the cage, but if it's possible to get them out of the cage as well. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. If the animals are deteriorating, um, at least in the U.S., uh, we can go to the courts and petition for alternative housing for animals in some cases, um, and that can make a world of difference to the dogs. Um, uh, there's a lot that can be done even in the protected contact kind of um, situation. Um, you can do a lot of, of basic manners training, target training, those kinds of things without ever having to go in with the animal. So it's quite possible to, um, to make these situations better for the animals. So I mentioned the forensic behavior evaluation. Um, typically, in these kinds of situations, it's more customized um, for um, the, the case and what's happened in the case. Um, I'm going to show you a very brief video of, of a case that um, I worked on. Um, one of the things to realize about um, forensic behavior evaluations is that they should always be videotaped. Um, um, you should identify the dog in some way with the case number, so it's very clear that that dog is being identified. Um, you should not talk much at all in a video that um, could be petitioned by the court. I've had attorneys tell me they've had to spend a, a day fighting because somebody on the video just said, oh, you poor dog, or you know something that, that they would then argue would bias um, bias the jury, so very important to be quiet. 
So this particular case um, was a number of years ago, and um, it was a situation where a 14-year-old um, Afri African-American girl um, was rushing um, through the park to her first day at work at a swimming pool, and she was attacked by two pit bulls. It was an adult male pit bull and a juvenile male pit bull. It turned out that they were father and son and belonged to the same owner. And so we were approached because the, um, uh, the prosecutor wanted to know if we could determine if the woman was aware that she was harboring dangerous dogs. And in particular, this was a, a lower class working white neighborhood. Um, the girl was African American um, and, uh, and they also were interested to know if it could possibly have been a racial issue that the dogs had been trained to do this. Um, so in terms of looking through um, witness testimonies and, and, and um, touring the neighborhood and looking at the property, there was really no other evidence that we could find um, that would indicate these dogs had any history of aggression. Um, and in, in fact, the male, the adult male, was very popular in the neighborhood and people were frequently bringing their female dogs to be bred to him. So. Um, so there were lots of his children around. Um, so when we came in to evaluate the dogs, um, it was protected contact. We weren't allowed to go in with the dogs per se. Um, so with the little bit of information we had, we wanted to try and figure out what was going to trigger these dogs to respond. So we did a lot of the typical kinds of things that you might do. Um, predatory kinds of uh, stimuli and so forth to see if we could get these dogs to trigger. We knew the girl was afraid of dogs, um, and as I said, she was rushing to get to her job. Um, so we envisioned what might happen if she um, saw two pit bulls running towards her. And I should mention the two pit bulls were unsupervised as well. Um, the owner's property backed onto the park, and there was a fence all around the park, um, but several people in the neighborhood had cut gates into through the fence so the dogs could she could open the gate and the dogs could go into the park on their own and they did on a regular basis this was the first time anything had happened so um, just to show you a little bit of the behavior evaluation I thought okay well if this kid was afraid of dogs she's probably running and screaming big male is the father, the white one is the juvenile. She had a backpack, so I thought it's possible she may have tried to protect herself. When I stopped moving, the young one lost interest to some degree. But there's still a significant difference in the behavior of these two dogs and that the adult male is just standing his ground and barking. The young one is trying to figure out or is, is looking more intent on, on trying to make contact. Now he's got a hold of my backpack. biting the bars. <laughs> I'm going to yell at them now to go away.
So um, what we saw there was actually extremely consistent with what the eyewitnesses had said. They said it, um, one dog was um, particularly persistent in trying to get at the girl. The first person that was on scene to help the girl was um, a school teacher who was quite overweight, and he couldn't, he couldn't get the dogs to go away, so he just laid on top of the girl, and the, the white dog, the report said the white dog was trying to get under him to get at the girl. So the young dog was very, very focused on the one girl and, and wasn't interested in him at all. And, um, and then they said that the black dog, they never saw him actually make contact. Um, so, you know, we were able to say that, you know, it's quite, quite feasible that this young dog who had been in the park a number of times may have never seen uh, girls screaming and flailing and running. And that potentially triggered this behavior, which is why the owner may not have been aware that, that this kind of thing could ever happen. Um, so, at least in this particular case, um, we were able to make a judgment that we felt the adult dog could probably be saved, um, but that the young dog should be euthanized. Um, come on, okay. So the other aspect of um, dangerous dogs in shelters is of course the dogs that are aggressive to other dogs. And, um, and this was a uh, um, situation a couple of years ago. It's called the Missouri 500 case. It was the largest dog fighting case in US history. Um, they seized over 400 adults and puppies from a variety of dog fighting yards. And um, in the course of, of keeping those dogs in protective custody, there was another 153 puppies born. So it was a lot of dogs. And, um, and we were invited by the Humane Society in Missouri, who was the lead agency, to come in and evaluate the dogs for them. Um, so when we're talking about evaluating fight bred dogs, um, I'm, not, I'm gonna skip over this because you've already seen the basic um, uh, behavior evaluation that we use. Um, but I just wanted to point out a couple of interesting things um, that come out of the evaluations. If I can get this to go for it, there we go. Um, so what you see here is, is a comparison, a contrast between um, the dogs that we evaluated in the Missouri 500 case and um, Dr. Amy Martyr's sample of um, shelter dogs going through the matchup program. And this just um, uh, lists the uh, percentage of dogs showing aggression on the various subtests. And because these are very different um, procedures, very different, and different evaluators and different contexts and everything, they're technically not comparable. So this work has not been published. Um, but it does, um, I think, reflect the reality of the situation is that um, we tend to see much less aggression towards people in the fight bred dogs than we do in just the general population of shelter dogs as a whole. And then in contrast, of course, we see significantly higher aggression towards other dogs than we do in the shelter population as a whole. And we're trying to take this a step further. We've done a little bit now this is not working very well there, um, comparing, um, breaking it down more and just comparing it with um, pit bulls that come into shelters that have no history of aggression or no, they, they don't come from, from fight bus cases versus the dogs that have. And, uh, and again, these are percentages of dogs showing aggression on the various uh, subtests. So we're seeing significantly higher um, incidence of aggression in mostly in the, the pit bulls that are coming into the shelter, and then lower levels of aggression towards other dogs. And it's very consistent with what we experience. Um, I should say that if, if, um, if you're familiar at all with how fighting dogs are used um, when they are in the pit, um, there are three people in there as well. There's a handler for each of the dogs and the referee, and they're often in very, very tight quarters. And um, knowing how ruthless these dog fighters can be, they are not gonna tolerate a dog that turns around and bites them, 
particularly when they're pulling them off each other. So, um, so I think there's a very strong selection process um, in place for selecting dogs that are very human friendly, very human social. However, of course, this is the big aspect, is um, how do we go about safely assessing these dogs um, for dog aggression? And uh, I showed you already the, the process that we go through in terms of um, using a helper dog and introducing them across a barrier first, then seeing their, their, observing their behavior at a distance and then allowing them to interact. Um, but when we first started doing these evaluations, um, you know, it was obviously fraught with a lot of, of stress because we were, we were worried about the safety of the helper dog, we were worried about the safety of the, the handlers, and we were, but we were highly motivated to get as accurate uh, an indication as we could because we knew it, basically we're talking about life and death situations here for these dogs. Um, so certainly the, the choice of a helper dog is critical. You want an unfamiliar dog um, that that is friendly and social, but not too pushy, um, and is resilient so that it can take, you know, dog after dog, potentially um, being aggressive towards it and not getting defensive or frightened. Um, and, uh, and so what we decided to do is see if we could use a model of a dog as an indication of how these dogs would behave with real dogs. Um, it would provide us with a much safer alternative to use. And uh, so when we had the opportunity to evaluate these, the, the Missouri 500 dogs, we said, yes, we'd love to come and do it. And we know you have a lot of dogs to evaluate. Would you please let us just do a little extra so that we can, get, we can collect these data? So the first thing we had to do was figure out what kind of dog to use. And I can show you that the choice of fake dog really makes a difference. So I thought the rough collie was a realistic looking dog, relatively speaking. I thought he looked pretty good, and she doesn't think so. <laughs> And then here's our plush dog that I don't think looks real at all. This was not a dog from a fighting case, by the way, but um, she'd been seized in a cruelty or neglect case, and uh, she had killed one of the, when they were in the facility, she had got loose and killed one of her other housemate dog, I mean, yard dogs. Those are very hard bites she's delivering. She's crushing the styrofoam skull. So based on that, we decided to use our plush dog that doesn't look that realistic. But uh, what we ended up doing is putting um, each dog through four tests. Um, they had a test with a fake dog, they had a test with an opposite sex dog, they had a test with the same sex dog, and, they, and then we used a control object which was just a chair with a sheet over it. And it did have a leash attached to it and a handler next to it as well, so that we kept that consistent. And, um, and we varied um, it in that half the dogs saw a real dog first, and half of the dogs saw the fake dog first. Um, and I, so I'm gonna show you a video of some of the responses that we observed. So in this case, uh, the dog on the left is the test dog, the dog on the right is the helper dog. 
and this is an opposite sex test. And the, for those of you who are interested in handling stuff too, um, pay attention to the leashes because there's differences in how these people are dealing with their real dogs. So she pretty much looked excited and happy about both of those. In this case, the dog on the right is the test dog, the dog on the left is the helper dog. Again, look at the difference in the leashes. I mean, I admit I'm hanging on to his collar as well, but the one on the left, the leash is high up, and we try to try to keep them as low as we can. So, same submissive kind of response to the fake dog. dog on the left is the hey. one being evaluated. It was hard to see that, so I just slowed it down so you could see that he wasn't messing around. Crushing styrofoam <laughs> sounds. Okay, this dog is pretty interesting. Um, it's the dog on the right that's being evaluated. He looks very curious. We were concerned enough to, to muzzle him, and what you can see is he gets stiff when. The helper dog sniffs him, but as soon as the helper dog turns away, he wants to interact. And here he is with the fake dog. We do kind of a, a standard kind of procedure, and, and, and one of the things we do is try to do a chin over, a rear up, no. a chin over. Back up, back up. Back up, back up. Yelling works sometimes. This dog, um, I didn't show the, uh, I was just now wanting you to see different reactions to the fake dog. So typically, you know, people will, if they haven't seen the videos, will say, how can you tell it's not, they're not just playing with the fake dog? I, I think, I assume that most people are pretty convinced this is not play. He's using a brake stick to get him off. And that's the other thing, if you are um, keeping dogs that, are, that have a history of biting in your shelter, you should have a brake stick on you. You should know how to use it. So it's the easiest way to get them to let go. Sometimes grabbing their tail works. Sometimes holding him up in the air works. Included this because it gives you a better view of how it's supposed to work. It takes me a little bit. <laughs> of course, you have to be extremely careful afterwards to guard against them redirecting. So, what did we find? <laughs> um, thank you. When we looked at 
the various responses to the different stimuli. Uh, we categorized the, them basically into friendly responses, which is blue, fearful responses, orange or neutral responses, um, pushy is in green, meaning they were rambunctious and unruly and in your face, but they didn't show any aggression. Uh, aggression is the yellow, and then sexual behavior is the red. And so the first thing I want you to look at is just the difference between the, do the dogs and the control object. Pretty much everybody was neutral to the control object, which is good. Um, we had a couple of friendly responses, but <laughs> mostly, and, and probably one dog tried to hump it, I guess. <laughs> but uh, uh, clearly, there's a, they're not treating the fake dog as an object. And if you look kind of generally at the pattern, it's pretty similar across the real dogs and the fake dogs. Um, we did have um, more, uh, less pushy behavior and more aggressive behavior to the fake dog because clearly we were able to go a little further and let them exhibit what they wanted to. Um, likewise with the, the sexual behavior, uh, you know, we were not going to let them molest a real dog, but they were allowed to molest the fake dog if they wanted to. And some of them did. <laughs> Um, and so this kind of, this is a table, a cross-tabulation table that shows um, the very specific um, number of responses where if the dog was friendly to the real dog, he was friendly to the fake dog. So, um, and as you can see, the numbers on the, on the uh, diagonal, which is the agreement, are quite high, particularly for the aggressive responses. And again, you know, there are some that make sense because you know, they're, they're aggressive to the fake dog, but they were only rated as pushy to the same-sex dog because that's all we could do. And the same thing with the sexual behavior. Um, but basically, that, that gives you an indication of agreement. Um, when we did the stats, um, basically what we found is of the dogs that were aggressive to the real dog, 81% of them were aggressive to the fake dog. So that's a significant correlation, and we did find a slightly higher correlation for the same-sex dog than the real dog. Um, obviously, it's not a perfect tool, but it is a reasonably useful tool. And, and again, if we're, if we're getting some false alarms in there um, that are aggress uh, identified as aggressive when maybe they wouldn't have been, we still feel it's better to err on the side of caution when it comes to dealing with these dogs. So we now test with a fake dog first, and if we don't see aggression, we proceed to a same-sex dog. But that means a lot of, um, we, we have minimized the amount we have to expose helper dogs to this situation. How much time? I got three minutes, okay. We're gonna zip through this really quick then. Um, so, you know, what, what do we end up doing with these dogs? Um, well, it, at this point, it really depends on how bad they are um, and whether or not we think that we can yeah. rehabilitate them. This is a, a dog from a fighting case on the right. He'd actually been purchased by an informant um, and he had been fought a couple times. And this was a very bad, very, very bad dog-dog intro. I have to say that my record is normally good, um, shockingly good, but this was a particularly unique situation. Um, this was a, uh, an ATF case, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms case, a federal case, and this dog had been purchased by the informant um, and had been held in the shelter for, for several months. And they all fell in love with him, all the agents, and they really wanted us to save him. And we showed him being aggressive to one dog and then another dog, and then finally I'm, I'm like, okay, we're gonna have to take a chance because they're, they're just not seeing it. So they saw it with that one. Um, what, was, what was good about Dragon is that um, he did show um, friendly, affiliative, social behavior towards females, just not males. So because he was their favorite and because we knew he had some level of social behavior, we thought it might be, we thought it would be uh, a good move to try and see what we could do with him. So, oh yeah, there he is with the female. Very different response. <laughs> the ATF agents are like, he can tell the difference? <laughs> <laughs> well, duh, yeah. <laughs> um, so we ended up taking Drag Dragon to Longmont Humane Society, which is in Colorado. Amy Sadler is the person in the middle, and um, she does a lot of work on, on 
so remedial socialization with dogs, and this was one of her first um, fighting dogs. Um, beside her is Terry Mills, the director of our blood sports division. And uh, so we drove Dragon out there, and we spent a week out there. And, uh, and this, hopefully, will not take longer than our time. We got a minute left, right? <laughs> So Dragon was nursed back to health before his behavior was evaluated, and he actually you know, turned into, from a scrawny little dog into a very fat dog, which turned out to be in our favor. So as I said, he was aggressive to male dogs. He was friendly with females, so that's why we chose him as a candidate. <laughs> I didn't realize I had that in there, so. And he was actually in uh, Virginia, so he had, he had a drive across country to get to Colorado. They do take in a lot of dog aggressive dogs um, at Longmont and now at Southampton Animal Shelter Foundation outside of New York. That's where Amy is now. So, he was muzzled in the beginning because we didn't know what to expect from him except bad things. <laughs> and uh, the nice thing about going to a facility like that where they're doing a lot of this type of work is they have a wide range of dogs to choose from. So we were able to, to select female dogs that were friendly to begin with. And yeah, he was an asshole at first. Um, but uh, um, Amy's program does use some corrections. They, they use a water spray, um, they use a shake can, and, uh, and the water spray was really effective for him. So he, uh, he, he started to be less reactive to them, but he still didn't seem to know how to interact with them. And he stood around and barked at them a lot, especially if they were playing. And like I said, him being fat really um, helped because he'd get exhausted very quickly and then we'd try him without the muzzle um, and see how he would do. And, uh, and typically when we were going to get a reaction, not surprisingly, it was when we introduced a new male into the group. But still at this point, they're all very tolerant, very friendly males, so even if he does react, they're not going to respond in kind. And um, oh yeah, she does use air horns sometimes too. Um, but he was very, very responsive to the water spray. And so this was all in two days. Um, he had two sessions a day, so by the end of day two, he was meeting new dogs and no longer being an asshole. And he started to show signs that he knew when he'd had enough. And he'd just go and lie down in the corner somewhere. And, uh, and we didn't see any signs of, of socially facilitated aggression. He would, he would bark if other dogs um, had a scuffle, but he didn't jump in. And, and we, of course, encouraged him to leave. So he started to make some friends, particularly with the girls. And this Brindle was the, the dog he met in the very beginning, the very first dog he met. And uh, he seemed most inclined to hang out with her. So day three now, and we can introduce new males. And as you see, they're almost all pit bulls. This was his first small dog, so we put him back on the leash in case anything went wrong, but uh, he was okay.
and for those of you who are familiar with working with dogs in groups, congested areas around the gates, those are the, the highest trigger points. Um, so we had to work through that. Um, and then, like I said, he started to just kind of hang out and relax and ignore them for the most part. He still didn't do a lot of interacting. But then we started to see him show a little more interest in the other dogs playing. And then he started to play with his, his brindle friend. It was always females, but in the beginning. It took him a long time before he started to actually do any play biting. Um, so I, I think he just really wasn't comfortable with the whole play thing for a while. And then he started playing with some males. So, Day five now, he's hanging out in a group with 11 other pit bulls. And it was on the end of day five that they actually put him on their adoption floor. Um, one of the, uh, wanted, we wanted to make sure, of course, that, you know, if he was adopted by somebody who was going to walk him around the neighborhood, that he was going to be okay meeting dogs in that situation, too, and clearly the leash can be um, a very different trigger, so we made sure that, um, that we in integrated that into the program, and he s started with dogs that he already knew, and then progressed to dogs he didn't know, and he did okay. And uh, he was always charming with people, so um, we had to we had to take advantage of him meeting this little girl. And this is him at an adoption event. Um, the other dog is one of the Michael Vick um, dogs from a dog fighting case, and uh, that dog too had had a history of fighting and is now a well-known therapy dog. And. Uh, at the time I made this, um, he was still oops, at Longmont. Um, that was about two years ago. He has been with this family for two years now and, uh, and doing extremely well. So it was a nice, a nice happy ending story. And uh, that's in contact information for Terry Mills, our blood sports uh, director. So if you ever have any, inf any questions about dog fighting, um, he's the man to contact. And uh, thank you very much. Sorry I kept you a little over.